Good evening. I am Uday Shetty, and you're watching another session of Pharma Best Practices webinars. The topic for today's presentation is use of quality risk management in a cell and gene therapy clean room contamination control. Today's session is the 90th session since we started Pharma Best Practices webinars way back in March 2020. With these 89 sessions, we have reached more than 22,000 professionals who have attended our session live and another 50,000 or so who have watched our recorded sessions. You can watch these recordings of all these sessions on our YouTube channel, the link for which will be given in the chat box shortly. We are pleased that during these tough times of pandemic, we could bring several subject matter experts to present on this platform for the benefit of pharma professionals. We thank you for your trust and faith in us. This is what keeps us going. As you know, information about these webinars is available on our website, specifically designed for this purpose, which is pbpw.in, Pharma Best Practices Webinars. On this website, you can register for all webinars which are planned in the next three months. You can watch recordings of the past webinars you can also read Pharma Best Practices blog written by several SMEs on very interesting and current hot topics. And if you wish, you can join our chat groups. A link for this is given here, which are discussion forums where technical subjects are discussed. Let me say a few words about today's webinar. This seminar will cover a risk-based approach to a contamination in a cell and gene therapy clean room. Details will be provided on how to follow a risk-based approach utilizing a fishbone diagram and the five whys centered on using good science. The most common causes of contamination will be discussed in case studies with fungal spore contamination. A recent case study will be covered in detail as well as microbial identification and how to ut utilize a risk-based approach will be presented. Let me say a few words about Jim, who doesn't need any introduction. Jim is a senior technical services manager at Steris Corporation. Jim is a frequent industry speaker and published several PDA book chapters and articles related to cleaning and disinfection and contamination control. He is active on PDS COVID-19 task force and the PDS Microbial Excursion Task Force. He, has co he was a co-author on PDS Technical Report number 70 on cleaning and disinfection. Jim teaches industry regulators with FDA, MHRA, and others, as well as the pharmaceutical, biotech, and medical devices industries at the PDA and at the University of Tennessee. Jim is the current president of PDA Missouri Valley Chapter and technical coordinator for the IEST. We also have Dan Klein. Dan currently holds the position of Senior Technical Services Manager at Sturris and has extensive experience in antimicrobials industry. He has authored numerous articles and several book chapters in peer-reviewed journals, including the recent chapter on disinfectant efficacy testing in blocks, disinfection, sterilization, and preservation. He is a listed co-inventor on multiple United States patents. Dan served as the chairperson of AOAC International's Committee on Antimicrobial Efficacy Testing and remains active in multiple industry and standard setting efforts. So presentation by both Jim and Dan will be for about 70 to 75 minutes, which will be followed by a Q&A session for about 10 to 15 minutes. Please ask your questions at the end of the presentation. You can type your questions in the questions tab of your control panel. With this words, few words, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jim and Dan to give their presentation. Over to you, Jim. Hey, thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Uday. We really appreciate that this morning, uh, which is evening for you in India. So uh, we have a, a, a really delightful presentation for you this morning that I think you'll get a lot out of. 
uh, we're going to be talking about a risk-based approach to addressing fungal spore contamination in a cell and gene therapy, or uh, as Europeans call it, the ATMP facility. So that will be the focus, and uh, I will be talking about a case study as well related to this. So there's my bio and background, if you want to learn a little more about me. Uh, and by the way, my uh, hobby, I chase tornadoes in my spare time. So if you ever see me over in India, I might be uh, trying to catch a, a tornado or two. And then we have uh, Dan Klein with me. He'll be taking over uh, partway into the talk this morning. And so I want to start off and talk a little bit about this slide. And uh, I think this is important to get the basic concept of where contamination comes from in your clean room overall. So whether it's a uh, cell and gene therapy facility and injectables, uh, any type of parenteral operation, uh, the basically the areas where contamination can enter, uh, the clean room and your drug production process are all basically similar. So one is when we talk about the facility. So whether it's a, a blood fractionation facility, uh, under cold conditions, cell and gene therapy, um, injectables, whatever type of clean room facility you have, uh, there's a big concept out there lately that we've been talking about at the PDA called uh, aging facilities. So as clean room facilities age, <clears throat> the facility itself ages because clean rooms when they're built from the ground up, so stick built facilities, they're designed to last about 20 to 25 years before significant repairs start to need to be uh, taking place. So when we talk about uh, aging facilities, things like the ductwork, uh, the flooring, uh, paneling on walls, so many things in the facility start to get older over time and wear down. The sealant on the floor wears down. Sometimes you have to put in a new floor in that time space. But the facility design and the facility itself can actually be a source of contamination. Uh, not only a particle contamination risk, but also a viable risk from a organism standpoint. Because it's in a lot of those surfaces. So for example, uh, if we get a facility with damaged flooring, uh, where molds or bacillus can live in those surfaces and be an ongoing threat to your clean room. Another key concept here that I laid out, and this is a big one because it's something we have published on, uh, I've done a lot of work with our uh, facility up in um, Minnesota, Brooklyn Park, AST Labs, where we publish some data on pass-through decon. So anytime you are bringing any material into a clean room, whether it's a um, in a plastic wrap, if it's a tool, uh, if it's intervention equipment, a cart, cartwheels, any of these are huge potential sources of bio burden in the clean room. And you need to have a validated decon process in place where you're using something either like a sporicide by wiping application, spraying the item down. Um, there are some clean room facilities that will put uh, VHP in a pass-through chamber. And so as you're bringing in, let's say, carded items, they're hit with the VHP from all directions. Uh, one of the sites I've worked at, Texas, uh, they bring items in in bags, and a lot of these items can be uh, vials, ampules, stoppers, and uh, they go through a UV uh, light where it's pulsed, UV light is pulsed on the item as it's coming through on the conveyor belt from all directions, and they get about a five log reduction in bio burden from that. So those are all, you know, things you can think about as ways to control bio burden entering the clean room, which is a huge source. Typically, uh, I would say it accounts for 15 to 20% of your bio burden contamination. Uh, if you've ever heard one of my colleagues in industry, Tim Sandel, he loves to talk about that concept as well. Uh, and then your number one source of bio burden in any clean room is the personnel. So whether it's operators or visitors to your clean room, this is a huge potential source, not just from the gowning, but things like the shoes and the shoe covers, those are all potential risk of bio burden contamination, which is why when you look at the most common uh, organisms you'll pick up on the environmental monitoring data, uh, you'll see it's organisms like micrococcus, staphylococcus, streptococcus. So a lot of these cocci, and these are shed from people 
entering the facility. So another one would be processes. Uh, whether you're, let's say you have a liquid process, if you have autoclaves in a room, anytime you have heat and humidity in the clean room, that can also add to uh, the amount of bio burden that you have in a clean room. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, if it's a blood fractionation facility, those cold conditions of minus five to five degrees C, those will potentially lead to uh, increases in bio burden as well. Some organisms like Bacillus cereus, which can be serious if you get it, or molds like Aspergillus, they can live very well in those cold room conditions. So utilities, whether it's water for injection systems, compressed gases like helium, argon, nitrogen, uh, these are all areas where organisms can be an issue. So for example, uh, one of the organisms we hear about a lot in the industry uh, is one that can fluctuate between aerobic and anaerobic environments. That's QD bacterium acnes. So if you have an operator with really bad acne and they're touching their face or their skin and they're you know, working in one of those compressed gas settings, uh, you can potentially get that organism in the clean room. So we have seen that. Uh, I've been to a couple of facilities in Nebraska that, that have that issue. Uh, and equipment, and especially where you place that equipment in a clean room, if you shut off any of the uh, airflow vents in the room or air exchange vents in the room, you block it, uh, that can lead to increased contamination because then you're not getting that true HEPA filtered air uh, in the clean room and HEPA filtered air over the filling zone. So even where operators stand in the clean room can pose a risk with that. So I call this slide the, the pillars of the industry <clears throat> that can, um, if you look at each of these rocks, each of these are particular concerns in terms of deciding upon which products you're gonna use in your cleaning and disinfection program, <clears throat> and even potentially what the frequency might be. So whether you're choosing a disinfectant or choosing a sporicide, uh, any of these variables can have a significant effect. So Usually when you choose a new product, you're looking, number one, typically at efficacy. So can it kill the bio burden I typically see in my clean room? That's a key thing. Uh, another thing, and Dan and I have run into this a lot lately with clean room facilities, compatibility of the disinfectant. And when I talk about compatibility, I'm not just talking about clean room surfaces. So it can be surfaces like metal, stainless steel, flooring, Lexan, et cetera but also compatibility with other disinfectants and compatibility with mop heads and application equipment. These are all big concerns. If you read the BPOG article from the PDA that came out last um, April or March of the start of the pandemic, uh, you'll notice that they talk uh, very vividly about compatibility on all those different, in all those different areas being a significant concern in choosing new products. Stability, so one of the big areas of concern is stability of the use dilution. How long is that product good for? And normally when we do use dilution testing, we're doing the testing on the product diluted in the bottle that is not shaken. So we're looking at the dilution, you know, that's actually sitting in the bottle and how stable that is. So those are key things to think about. Um, another key one would be safety of the product. You don't want to harm your operators or get them complaining about the odor and overuse of a product. Disposal. So Dan and I get that question very frequently. In fact, I average maybe three times a week. Uh, can, is it a product that I can send to drain? There's a big uh, thing in the industry right now on sustainability and green. So is it something that can go straight to drain or do I need to neutralize it? Are there restrictions on things like phenols? Are there restrictions on uh, dissolved solids? You know, what, what, what is your local water treatment facility saying? Rinsing and residue removal is another one. You don't wanna have significant buildup of residues and residues, by the way, can come from many different sources, not just disinfectants and sporicides. They can come from shoe covers, gowning material, your production process, one of the clean rooms I worked at uh, before the pandemic uh, in the Midwest, uh, they were making a depression drug and they had a lot of that drug that was leaking out onto the floor in the clean room, complexing with the phenols and making a uh, red, yellow, dark stain on the floor. 
uh, and we actually had to use alcohol to get rid of that. So you have to think about that. Even your drug products can stain and create residue issues on your floor. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, key things involving a case study in the cell and gene therapy uh, market. So first, I want to give you an overview here. Let me move this down on my screen. I want to give you an overview of the cell and gene therapy process, whether it's allogeneic uh, or whatever type of process you're doing with the cells. So when we look at the uh, beginning of the process, you typically bring in the core blood in a cooler into the clean room. So you'll be going from, let's say, an uncontrolled area or ISO 8 area into, let's say, an ISO 7 area. So you bring that, uh, thaw the blood out in a cooler, you bring it into the clean room. So one key application of disinfectants would be with the cooler. You can spray it down or wipe it down with a sporicide. Uh, the next is manipulation of the cells. So you'll be isolating the T cells and the natural killer cells where you're going to be doing work with those cell lines in a hood. I can tell you that that's very delicate work. I used to work with uh, cell lines in a, in, a, um, in a biotech lab, and with those cell lines, we'd inject them with Epstein-Barr virus, which will keep the cells uh, alive indefinitely. So when you work with these cells, what you're going to be doing in cell and gene therapy is you're going to be then adding a receptor or a protein to the cell and eventually uh, these cells are going to be put back into either one patient or multiple patients. So another application of disinfectants comes when you put them in an incubator. You're going to be growing them up in this incubator here. And that incubator is going to need to be periodically decontaminated. So using a sporicidal wipe or spraying it with a sporicide or a high level disinfectant would be a good application because you want to make sure you don't have bacteria or mold in that incubator that could be contaminating the system. So then I'm going to take the cells and harvest them and wash them. So there might be equipment that you're working with there that can be disinfected. Uh, then I'm going to be filling it into bags and vials where then it's going to be stored in, let's say, a minus 80 or even below minus 80, where it's going to be cryo frozen. Those cryo frozen cells are then going to be shipped off to either one facility to go back into that single patient or multiple facilities to go into multiple patients, depend of, depending upon what type of cell and gene therapy process you're, you're completing. Many of them, by the way, can do both. <clears throat> so some of the key things you need to consider is how am I gonna use the disinfectant products in my facility in a new cell and gene therapy facility? So one of the big applications is 70% IPA or ethanol on gloved hands. You're gonna be doing a lot of glove uh, usage and man manipulation of cells inside that BSC hood. So that's a key area where you wanna make sure to have routine glove sanitization, maybe every 10 minutes or 30 minutes, depending upon how you wanna write your SOP inside that hood. Uh, you're gonna be using uh, hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid wipes to wipe down that hood and wipe down any items you're bringing into the hood. Let's say you've got vials for the cells you're working with, or you've got bags of items you're bringing into the hood. Uh, any of that is gonna need to have a wipe down, or you can spray it down with sporicide and then wipe it, uh, but there will be some disinfection process uh, in place there. And it really should be validated. You need to show that these products are effective on those surfaces. So wiping down the outside of the uh, incubator is another key step. As I mentioned earlier, uh, you can use a sporicide on it or a sporicidal wipe. Uh, you want to go back periodically with IPA or ethanol or hydrogen peroxide, uh, so 6% hydrogen peroxide to remove any residue buildup. We recently did a study where we showed 6% hydrogen peroxide is actually very effective in removing uh, of disinfectant residues in BSC hoods and incubators. So then your routine cleaning and disinfection of that ISO 7, ISO 8 clean room and the gowning room, which is typically ISO 8 as well, you can either use a quaternary ammonium disinfectant. Many sites will use a ready to use version. You can also use a phenolic disinfectant, alkaline or acidic. And again, periodic rinsing should be in play uh, for removal of residues over time. Maybe you start off monthly 
uh, doing that with water for injection for floors and walls, 70% IPA for glass and stainless steel. Periodic use of a sporicide is also critical. So hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid or bleach, uh, because you wanna make sure you're controlling fungal spores or bacterial spores, which in the case study I'm gonna talk about is an issue. Uh, and then you can use IPA, as I mentioned, for rinsing and removing on high reflective surfaces such as stainless steel or glass. You're gonna need routine disinfection of that BSC hood. The hood is very high risk. It's an area where you're doing uh, this cellular manipulation and work with the cell lines, putting on proteins uh, and doing you know, specific work with them in the hood. You wanna make sure that area is clean and disinfected routinely. So here's some of the data we generated. And if you look at it, we're looking at pass-through decon applications. So with stainless steel, uh, we spike these with Aspergillus brasiliensis, which is a pretty hard to kill fungal spore. I believe it was 16404, the American type culture strain we used. And as you can see here with IPA and the sporicide, which was a hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid chemistry, uh, with a five minute contact time here and a one minute with the IPA, uh, you're seeing we start with a 5.3 baseline inoculum, but you're seeing greater than four log reduction. So actually almost complete kill on these surfaces. So uh, with stainless steel, we see very good efficacy with self-sealed pouches, which are used a lot uh, in these clean room settings and in the BSC hood. Again, five minute wet contact times, uh, and we are seeing very good complete kill, so very good efficacy. Polycarbonate, which is Lexan, a plastic surface. Uh, we, again, at a five minute wet contact time, uh, we're seeing really nice efficacy. So those are very good products to employ for routine disinfection in your hoods. And then we actually, actually wanna look at bacterial spores as well. So Bacillus subtilis, stainless steel, uh, IPA at one minute contact time, the hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid sporicide again, and then here we kind of have a synergistic effect with that and IPA being added, so five minute, one minute. And again, here you're seeing, um, you know, very close to a two log reduction in that five minute wet contact time, so some really good data there, because if you look at uh, USP 1072, it talks about a two log reduction, so that's some nice data. Uh, the self-seal pouch with the sporicide, so the hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid chemistry, uh, followed by the IPA, again, a synergistic effect and almost a two log reduction again. So very good performance. And then Lexan or polycarbonate, again, sporicide, so hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid, followed by IPA, and again, uh, over a one log reduction in five minutes. So that's some nice data there. And so options for decon in these BSC hoods, which are used very frequently uh, in the cell and gene therapy arena, you can use sporicidal wipes, which are an option, which we, you know, there's a lot of data out there surrounding them. Uh, hydrogen peroxide wipes are another choice, 6%. Uh, and certainly when it comes to your bucket systems, frequent use of a sporicide in the clean room, uh, maybe starting off on a monthly basis to control spores is a good idea. And as you can see here, there's ready to use options, uh, especially with trigger sprays for your BSC hood. Uh, when it comes to your quads for um, routine use in cell and gene therapy sites. And so some more data we generated here, here's the hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid chemistry, the bleach chemistry, which is 5,250 ppm sodium hypochloride. You see very good performance here against Aspergillus brasiliensis, so a hard to kill fungal spore. And then here we look at 6% hydrogen peroxide. That takes quite a while to build up efficacy, probably somewhere between 30 and 60 minutes. So you're not gonna see the performance that you would with these two sporicidal technologies. And that's the same story here when we look at Bacillus subtilis, which is a bacterial endospore. Uh, we again see very good efficacy with the bleach and the hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid chemistries. However, the 6% takes a much longer time to build efficacy. And if I were to put data up here with Bacillus cereus, it's even worse with the 6% in terms of performance. Uh, these other chemistries are much more efficacious. And this actually comes from a PDA poster and it's just showing the 
same data I just showed you, but in a little bit more color. So you can see here the Aspergillus brasiliensis data and the B. subtilis data. So when we look at a cell and gene therapy case study, uh, and in Europe, by the way, they call it advanced uh, ATMP facilities. So it's the same terminology, but it's for Europe. Uh, when I dealt with the facility, Dan and I dealt with the facility uh, at the start of the pandemic, uh, they had very high environmental monitoring counts and specifically related to fungal spores in the facility. Uh, at the time we found, um, and we had a colleague of ours from Bowsource that was actually on site as well, troubleshooting, uh, but they had very excessive use of water and rinsing and standing water in a clean room always presents a significant risk for uh, mold, and when it comes to drain areas, it's a risk for biofilm. <clears throat> they had uh, very poor cleaning methodologies for the BSC hoods, where all they were using, it was like going to a um, hospital compounding pharmacy, so 503A or B. The only product they were using was 70% IPA. And the problem with IPA, it's great uh, for vegetative bacteria, but some of the harder to kill molds and especially bacillus, you're not going to see a lot of efficacy. Uh, they had tacky mats, and there's different kinds of tacky mats you can get in industry. So you can get the kind that are always, you know, you don't replace the mat, and then you can have the rip-off mats that you change off on a, let's say, weekly or monthly basis. Well, they had the permanent mats, and they were very dirty. So one of the theories could be, is that dirt and residual buildup on the mats, is that a risk? for bio burden, maybe. Another thing can be the mop heads. So the mop heads there appeared uh, to be very soiled and discolored. They were black and dark brown. So that's something to consider too when you're troubleshooting uh, the scenario. Another big one was, and this is something Dan and I found out about that I, I thought was very interesting. They were doing a one to 99 dilution of the sporocyte, which was very ineffective because to get better Fungal efficacy, you really needed a 1 to 32. So dilution rate is a big issue. They were also using the wrong dilution for one of the phenols. So not having the right dilution rate, they were using a half ounce per gallon. The dilution rate should have been one ounce per gallon. That's a big risk for contamination because you're using half the active solution. So then what are the next steps in the investigation? How do we proceed forward from here? Well, one of the things we use as a tool is the Ashikawa or uh, fishbone diagram. I know uh, before Scott Sutton passed, we were doing a lot of work on the uh, Microbial Deviations Task Force, uh, looking at different versions of fishbone diagrams, and, and uh, he published extensively on this in the industry. So here, our fungal spore contamination, let's say it's an Aspergillus in this case. Uh, that was one of the uh, molds that was isolated on site there and, and a potential risk. So you start to look at man. So are operators cleaning the facility correctly? Have they been trained effectively? Those are the kind of things we look at there. Measurement. Are we doing enough environmental monitoring? Do we do too much environmental monitoring, right? Are we looking, do we have the right media plates? So uh, soybean digest auger, are we seeing mold on the auger? What about uh, materials? How are the materials being decontaminated that we bring in the clean room? Are we using a sporocyte? Are we using a wipe? Are we spraying? Are we mopping? How are we addressing this? What methods of application are we using? Some facilities want to fog all the time. The problem and downside to fogging is you don't get that manual interaction with the surface, that force and friction on the surface that can dislodge or remove uh, items and, and organisms and bugs from the surface, just by spraying, you're not going to get that. So when we talk about machine, how are we applying these? Are we using a scrubber, right? Uh, we have facilities in France where they use a lot of these uh, scrubbers, they get on it and ride it across the clean room. So how are we cleaning that area? So one other tool is the five Ys. So, uh, and sometimes they even add a six, six to make a six Y, but the five Ys, right? Our facility is contaminated with aspergillus, right? That's the problem statement. So what's one of the Ys? Well, 
the wrong dilution of the disinfectant and sporocyte are being used on site. Is that a risk? I would say yes. <clears throat> Only IPA is being used for the pass-through decon and in the BSC hood. Is that the right product? Is that the right chemistry? Uh, rinsing with potable water from a sink is being used each time in the room. Is that the best quality of water to use? Should we be using RO or WFI? Training on cleaning doesn't take place. Uh, anyone that knows Anne Marie Dixon in the industry, I've known her for about 21 years, and she's a huge proponent of training. Every so often new things develop in industry, Dan and I know this, you need to learn about them and that operators should be trained on them. How often do I change out that use dilution? How many strokes do I make on that surface in the clean room? How often do I need to change out the mop head? Do I need to be concerned about bio burden growing on the mop head? How do I prevent the risk of contamination of the wipes? So those are all potential concerns to think about. <clears throat> so another why and my fifth why here, the mop head looks black prior to cleaning and after use. Should the mop heads really be black? What's that coming from? Are they not properly laundered? Are they not irradiated, right? Those are concerns. Yesterday I was on a call with Betty Howard. Uh, she's from our isometrics facility, uh, gamma sterilization expert in the industry for about 40 years. She'll be the first one to tell you that improper sterilization is always gonna be a risk. If you don't sterilize it properly, uh, then you have a risk of bio burden being in the room. Here's a big concern. So we have these BSC hoods. You wanna make sure to use IPA for residue removal in the hoods. You wanna be, uh, be sure you have routine use of disinfectants uh, in the hood. You can use wipes to wipe it in there. And I would start always start at the top, overlapping unidirectional strokes is the way to do this. And even on the surface, uh, frequent use of a sporocyte in the hood is very critical. So you can spray it, you can use a sporocidal wipe, but frequent use of a sporocide. Why? Because mold and bacillus are high risk in the hood, especially of, uh, and another key thing that Dan and I know about in cell and gene therapy, a high risk would be contamination from outside viruses. So you wouldn't want something like polio virus or um, let's say parvovirus or another strain of adenovirus coming in and infecting your cells. Periodic residue removal, so using IPA, using water for injection, removing any residue, so those residue molecules don't actually get in your product. So what are some recent FDA warning letters? What are uh, regulators like Thomas Arista in India, a good friend and colleague of mine, he's the FDA's chief inspector over there. Uh, what are they concerned about? Well, Tom would say, uh, when he goes to a facility, this is a good example of a warning letter uh, from him. Catomium and Aspergillus were actually recovered uh, on the firm's pellet assistant technician gloves, right? Fingertips. So on their fingertips, they're isolating mold spores. That's a issue. That's a risk. We have seen that happen in some cell and gene therapy facilities. And notice that's from this year. So regulators get concerned about that. Another good one that I see frequently, and I was in Rio a few years ago, where I looked up at the ceiling and they would turn off the air handling system in the clean room at night, which you should never do. And you could look up at the ceiling and see it was all coated with black and brown stains. It looked like a uh, speckled, uh, speckled moth. Uh, and when I asked about that, that was actually because uh, they had a mold contamination in the ceiling and they were trying to get rid of it. And I said to them, by turning off the air handling system at night, that's like what they did at the um, in New England at the compounding pharmacy. When they were doing that, turning it off it's, uh, leads to very high humidity levels in the room. And uh, because of those high humidity levels, you can get mold growth everywhere. I remember one facility that I was at uh, recently in uh, Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil, where they were actually opening the windows in the clean room and then wondering why they have so many mold heads. Mold is an issue. So here's another uh, fairly recent uh, 483 by the FDA. They observe mold 
in a filled drug product around the cap line. That's a problem. I can tell you that uh, whenever I have FDA regulators come out and speak for our PDA, uh, they are very concerned when they see mold in a product or even around a cap line, because that's going into a patient. Uh, when you look at New England compounding pharmacy, most of the fatalities were linked to fungal meningitis from the contamination. Uh, here's another good example here. Uh, this comes from an FDA warning letter. They found large clumps of dark material uh, that were reviewed as, uh, revealed as mold. So when I did an audit of a facility in Lyon, France, about six years ago, I was watching them clean the facility uh, from up in the rafters. You could look down and see that the WFI in the buckets was all completely black. And the bottom of the curtains around the filling zone was all black. So I asked the clean room manager and they said, well, they've always been black. No, they haven't. Those bottoms of the curtains, they're all black. That's aspergillus or some kind of black mold growing on the curtain. IV bags are a big concern. So companies out there uh, that make IV bags, IV solutions like saline or antibiotics and IV bags, they have these big long conveyor belt systems. The problem with the conveyor belts, the bags leak. So that material and the saline leak out of the bag, they get onto the conveyor belt and make it very sticky. Thus a good source and a good food source for mold growth. So cladosporium, which I've seen a lot in Southern California and Puerto Rico, tends to be a big issue. In Puerto Rico, when they burn off the sugarcane fields in the fall, it releases this cladosporium into the environment and you get it in all the clean room facilities. So we see spore cleanse and bleach usage go way up. And whenever you do a, an uh, investigation on site and you have contamination risk, if you go above action limits uh, in your environmental monitoring, and uh, you should be routinely identifying what these isolates are. I've run into facilities that think they don't need to identify what some of these organisms are that when they exceed action and alert limits on a routine basis. They need to document this. You need to find out what is, what are these organisms? So from a microbial standpoint, when it's bacteria and uh, fungal spores, it's a big concern for regulators. So doing a risk-based approach, you need to kind of start from top and go down to the bottom. Is the mold or organism, is it toxic? Is it pathogenic? Does it affect uh, human beings, right? Uh, is it on product contact surfaces? If so, that's a big concern. Is it in a filled product? That's a bigger concern. Where have I picked it up on site? When doing your risk map, I know one of the facilities up in Montreal that had a big aspergillus outbreak. They picked it up in a mulch pile in a parking lot. They picked it up in a steroli test suite. They picked it up in an ISO 5 clean room where they were filling a CT dye into containers. Do a risk map and a risk diagram, right? You need to come up with possible assignable causes. And as Charles River will tell you, you need to ID the organism down to the genus and species level if possible, because guess what? You could have three different molds. Just because it looks the same, doesn't mean it, it's the same. Amy McDaniel, from uh, she's with uh, BMS now, she used to be with FDA and was the head of micro at Pfizer. She'll be the first to tell you, ID the organism. You wanna proactively prevent it from reoccurring in the facility. And anytime you have mold spores, it's a big issue and it requires a CAPA investigation. You could use HACCP or whatever you know, means you need to do for the investigation, but you need to investigate. Uh, if you just have one mold spore hit, one hit, right? I've been in four hour discussions with upper management about one hit. Is that really a concern? Do you periodically see mold in a facility or not? So doing a risk diagram and a risk analysis here, uh, start to sample the different locations in the, in the facility, the water, steam, compressed gases, environmental monitoring data, and personnel. <clears throat> Decide how frequently you're gonna be doing this sampling. This should all be routine sampling, by the way. And then look at your data. How often are you picking up organisms? What's your excursion rate? Uh, if you look at the uh, USP 1116 on environmental monitoring, what's your monthly hit rate, 
right? Those are all questions you need to ask. And finally, for me, before I turn this over to Dan, when you look at our famous pyramid in the industry, you need to consider some key things. Most frequently used product in any clean room is the alcohol, IPA or ethanol. You sanitize gloved hands, you sanitize any items, hopefully you're not bringing in McDonald's iced tea, but any items you're bringing into the clean room. And don't bring in items like the cell phone. Why? Where have I had my cell phone today? Everywhere I've been. So cell phones are very high bio burden items. Bringing them in the clean room is not good. If Richard's watching this from Singapore, he knows, don't ever put the cell phone on top of a moving car. That's also not good. So alcohols are an issue. Uh, something you typically use to kill your bio burden with. Uh, use about four to five times as much alcohol as you use sporicides. Should, sporicides should never be used every day except in a BSC hood or spraying items down coming into that hood. So sporicides in the clean room itself, you can start off with monthly and either increase or decrease that frequency based on EM trending data in the hits of spores. Your workhorse of the program, as Thomas Arista would say, or John Metcalf from FDA would say, is the disinfectant, the phenol or the quat, because they both clean the surface and disinfect and kill what's on the surface. So again, alcohol, use a lot of that in the clean room, sporicide, not so much. Uh, but if you go up the pyramid, you're going to increase in the level of kill. If you start at the top and go to the bottom, you increase in the frequency. You use about, again, <clears throat> four to five times as much alcohol as sporicide. So with that, I'm taking it to Dan here. All right. So I'll give Jim a little break here uh, and talk more about fungi specifically. So we, Jim talked about case studies and 43s related to mold and fungi. So what I want to do is just kind of get a little deeper into the who, the what, the where, and the how of fungi. So who are we dealing with? What are the types of fungi that you might encounter that, that Jim and I often see when we're talking to, to customers? Where? Where might you see this fungal contamination? Where might it come from? What? What makes it so problematic? Why is this an issue that we really need to be concerned about? And then finally, how? How do we kill them? So starting with the what. What types of fungi do we most often see? Um, you can see here, we have a list of some common, you know, some common fungi, your aspergillus, your penicillium, uh, maybe your stachybotrius, some of your sick building molds, cladosporium, for example, um, going all the way down to ketomium, which is uh, a more frequently turning up in different places that we can talk more about, all the way down to your single cell fungi, your candida albicans, your yeast. And these are very hard to kill. They're very problematic. So I took this table from uh, my former boss and colleague, Jerry McDonald, um, which shows the hierarchy of susceptibility of microorganisms, all the way from the envelope viruses, very easy to kill, um, uh, going to inactivate essentially on surfaces or with mild disinfectants, all the way up to your spores, your prions. Well, if you look at your fungal spores, like your aspergillus, your penicillium, you're harder to kill than bacteria. Um, even, even your vegetative uh, fungi uh, are going to be harder to kill than gram-positive bacteria and some large non-envelope viruses. So when we're talking about fungi and killing them, we're, we're talking about a real challenge here that has to be uh, considered. As Jim talked about, you know, the rotation in of sporicides and the use of sporicides, and we'll talk more about that. One thing I do want to share, and I think this is, might be the first time we've ever shared this publicly, it's uh, in a pending article that, that Jim and I are working on, um, but this really outlines Fungal, different fungal species that we've commonly isolated and their relative susceptibility to disinfection relative to each other. Uh, so even within that class of general fungi and fungal spores, not all fungal species are created equal. So you have your easier to kill fungi, like your single cell yeast, like your candida, they're gonna be relatively easy to kill, kind of similar to a gram negative bacteria, not that hard. Uh, harder than that's gonna be a trichophyton species, for example. Uh, athlete's foot fungi is uh, trichophyton metagrophytes or indigitale. Um, that's going to be a little bit harder to kill than the single cell candida. Harder yet are going to be your cladosporium, maybe your penicillium, even, even worse than there. Uh, your ascomycota, your sac fungi, your aspergillus species, and then your ketomium. We've put a lot of work into this because it, it is important, as, as Jim's talking about, when 
identify, identify. It's important to know not just, okay, I got someone that's growing on my SDA plate, but, but what is growing? Because that helps to choose a, a, a strategy to remediate and make sure that that goes away. Um, and after much debate, it, it seems like a lot of the data suggests that you know the ketonia may even be harder to kill than the aspergillus from a disinfection point of view. And that's probably why we're seeing it more and more uh, out in the real world. So the next question is the where, where do we see them? Here's an image of, of uh, a nice image of an aspergillus plate uh, from my lab. Um, you can see the kinetospores, you know, the branching elements, eukaryotic fungi, getting those, those spores, those kinetospores up on branching elements to spread into the world. Um, and there can be a lot of sources from fungi. Typically, it's not gonna come from the humans. It's not gonna be typically like a, a coagulase negative staph or a micrococcus. That a human being is going to have as our normal skin flora. It's going to come from some kind of non-indigenous source. Um, things like broken pipes. Jim talked about water. Uh, the HVAC shutdown case is a, is a great example on why you need to keep your air handling system in operation. You don't want to get high humidity and wet environments that are going to result in a mold bloom. Um, having uh, areas that are uncontrolled, completely uncontrolled, close to your clean rooms is something you have to be careful about. Or moving things in that maybe don't belong within your clean rooms or within your laboratories for that matter. Um, in my microbiology R&D laboratories, one of my rules was no corrugated cardboard because mold spores love to live within the corrugation of the cardboard, especially if it's a little bit damp and you could have all kinds of problems um, for where the mold can come from. So some examples of some things that we've seen in the field uh, that have uh, resulted in, in mold outbreaks. Here's one, it's uh, high pressure impingement sprayers used to apply disinfectants or whatever. In this case, it was actually, the, the pressure was so great that it damaged the wall and you can see caused holes in the wall. And there were about 30 probably small holes in here that exposed the sheetrock, exposed the drywall, exposed that, that porous, often damp material that should have been exposed. And that certainly resulted in fungal problems. A couple more uh, popular one is the uh, fabric tipped marker um, as, a, as a possible area in which uh, fungal spores can, can reside and obviously gonna be transferred everywhere. Another interesting case was the behind a clean room door kick plate. So some moisture gets behind that kick plate, you get a fungal bloom, you don't see it just looking at it, but every time you push on that, kick it open, you're sending some of those spores out in the world. So that certainly could be an issue. Uh, cartwheels, um, or carts in general. So, you know, cartwheels, we're all you know, pretty cognizant that you have these fungal spores, you don't wanna get them in your clean room. So anything that cartwheel is gonna roll over is gonna pick up uh, bacterial and fungal spores, so you need to disinfect that with a spore side or a spore side and wipe even better. Um, that's pretty intuitive, but under the handle, uh, for example, under the handle of the cart is an area you have to check. Uh, under the cart itself, you know, tip that cart over, disinfect the bottom. Um, those are areas that fungal spores can sneak in to your area. So that's kind of a little bit about the, the where are they coming from. Um, now what, what are we dealing with here? And these are some images, and I just, I, I love SEM images in general, but these are a couple from, uh, from, from our facility uh, that just really shows the Aspergillus brasiliensis uh, canidiospores in detail. You can see the spiny spore, and that represents the mature phase of the spore. And you can look at this and kind of imagine that it's gonna be pretty hard to disinfect. I mean, these things are evolved to spread distances on air currents. Uh, in harsh environments, so they are going to be very challenging uh, to kill uh, with a disinfectant. They're also, you know, have evolved to hide, you know, small enough to fit in the nook, to fit in the nooks and crannies and little imperfections into floors and into walls and into different surfaces that can be hard to get to, and then they can very e easily aerosolize from there uh, and spread from place to place. So you have to be able to get to them. And again, these are more images from from our laboratory that shows those aspergillus spiny spores hiding within grooves of a, of a, of a flooring surface. Um, and you can see how they can be very resistant to disinfection. How they could be very hard to get to and very hard to kill, but yet could very easily get out of there to spread and cause problems within a cleaner environment. And this is what you don't want. I mean, this is that kind of, the, the exact type of spread that, that you don't wanna get. 
uh, because once you get to this point, you're tearing everything down to the studs and you're starting over. Um, certainly an issue. So finally, the how. You know, how do we get rid of them? One, as Jim mentioned, you know, identify and know what you're dealing with. Uh, the catomium globosum, it's hard to grow. The, the titers tend to be low in the laboratory, so we're still learning quite a bit about it. But indications are, and discussions we've had with other industry leaders are that it's a very hard fungus to disinfect, possibly even harder than uh, many aspergillus species, like aspergillus brasiliensis, ATCC 16404, which has always been known as one of the really challenging molds to disinfect. The catomium, uh, when, when testing with a, with a phenolic active ingredient, uh, seems to be even more difficult. And aspergillus certainly is, is, no, is, is not easy to kill. Um, this shows some data with an unformulated quad. So this wasn't a, 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 a actually formulated product. Um, you can formulate a quad to get some enhanced fungal activity. Uh, but in this study, we're just looking at the active ingredient to try to compare some different fungal species. And this goes back to that hierarchy of susceptibility I was talking about, about the different resistance between the strains. And you can see here, Candida albicans, boom, complete kill. Uh, Trichophyton interdigitale, no problems, less than three minutes uh, in, this, in this time kill suspension test. Uh, but the aspergillus, even up to five to 10 minutes is gonna be a lot harder to kill. Um, so it's important, again, it comes back to that identification and understanding what we're working with because not all fungi are the same. Um, not all applications or conditions are gonna be the same either. So here we're looking at some different surfaces uh, for Aspergillus brasiliensis compared to Penicillium uh, chrysogenum, in which you can see we have two different phenols and, and IPA. And on the glass, the, the Aspergillus seems to be maybe a little harder to kill, um, but not much. On phenol B, they're about equivalent. On stainless steel, again, another relatively smooth inert surface. Uh, you see some slight differences with the phenol A, with the relative resistance of the Aspergillus versus the Penicillium. Uh, still pretty good activity though against against both for the 70 percent ipa um, and then you look at a floor and you see something you know kind of different here in which the astrogillus becomes much more challenging and again this is the, the point of this is that surface type can impact efficacy uh, we have surface interactions with the disinfectant and the microorganisms you also as i mentioned have those imperfections that you might have in a flooring sample that you might not have in a smooth glass sample that can work differently with different microorganisms depending on their size or how they clump or things like that. But I, I include this data just to really reinforce that when it comes to disinfecting fungi in general, understanding you know, the key variables and being able to really identify what you're dealing with and identify what variables are important to get rid of your problem are essential. So with that, one key variable is gonna be contact time. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Jim here uh, to talk more about that. Uh, one of my favorite topics, mm -hmm. contact time, right? It's something that uh, we've been talking a lot about in the industry lately. So uh, yeah, let me talk about that a little bit. So contact time is something FDA regulators are actually looking very closely at. And whether it's Thomas Arista, John Metcalf, Sharon Toma, any of these FDA regulators, and it's not just FDA, I, I can even tell you that Andy Hopkins with MHRA, uh, that they're all looking at these things too. So I put up here a very recent uh, warning letter uh, from the FDA, uh, actually 483 from the FDA in March of this year, where they are looking at contact time. So here's what it says. It says, the contact time of the disinfectants used for gloved hands and surfaces were not documented as reviewed. So contact times were not noted as uh, disinfectant for hands or surfaces uh, does not have established times and procedures in the room. The investigation concluded that the adequate procedures for gowning and sanitization uh, were in place, but employees were simply not following them. So that's a big issue. When uh, you talk to Thomas Arista, one of his favorite things he likes to talk about when he audits facilities, and he brings a stopwatch. He clicks on the stopwatch when they start to mop the floor and the wall, and he clicks on it again when the surface is dry. So that wet contact time is really absolutely critical to having good and uh, very effective microbial kill 
in the clean room. And, and that's something that any regulator would be looking at. And I can tell you, I've recently had some big conversations with a lot of the, uh, well, one of the big uh, biotech companies where they are having a hard time monitoring contact times because <clears throat> the cleaning team will come in the room, they'll clean and disinfect the room, but then no one denotes what the contact time is in the room. So they should be marking down when they started cleaning the room and when they finished cleaning the room so that we know, okay, that room was, you know, there was at least a 10 minute wet contact time. Based on my field experience over 21 years, I can tell you that in ISO 9, ISO 8, ISO 7, and ISO 6 clean rooms, when you put a spore side or disinfectant on the surface, it will remain wet for about 20 to 25 minutes. And that's because the airflow, so the airflow exchanges in the room <clears throat> are around, let's say, uh, 10 to 30 air changes per hour. However, when you talk about ISO 5 clean rooms, you get very, very fast airflow, maybe one to 400 air changes per hour. So in those clean rooms, uh, they dry very quickly and you may need to reapply the disinfectant to get the wet contact time or something else Thomas has mentioned with FDA, you can do supplementary coupon studies at shorter contact times to show that you can kill the hardest to kill bio burden in that room in a shorter time frame. That would be acceptable. So here's another uh, recent 483 by the FDA where they're looking at this. And if you read it here, it says, uh, that they do not ensure contact times are accomplished. Uh, there is no contact time established for the ISO 5 area, and that there is nothing in the procedure determining how much area uh, can be wiped with a single mop surface or hand surface wipe. So that's a big thing. When you do your uh, cleaning studies in the room, you should be working with the mopping and, and wipe manufacturers and determine from your studies uh, how many times do I can I mop the surface with that mop head before I need to click it off and get a new mop head to mop the surface, right? The same thing with wipes. Anne Marie will tell you you should be able to four, fold that wipe into four sections, and then with each of the four sections, mop or wipe a surface area with that wipe. That's another key concept. Uh, here's another one where we talk about contact time. If you read up here, it says your firm failed to use adequate contact time for the sporocidal agent used as part of your disinfectant program in the APA. Your firm failed to establish adequate system for cleaning and disinfection of the room and procedures in the aseptic area. Wet contact time is essential, especially with the sporocide. If you have a high risk area, uh, let's say it's an area where you're passing items in to a clean room from a uh, uh, Maybe it's from uh, some outside area. If you have, um, you know, like at our facility here in St. Louis, we have a lot of areas where there's docks and there's material coming in from trucks and docks. So when you have that kind of thing happening and you're taking it in from a warehouse, you need to have very good uh, cleaning and disinfection procedures so you're not bringing spores in. So that sporicide contact time is absolutely critical. When I did an audit at a facility up in Montreal a few years ago, I was watching them put all these bags with uh, equipment in it on a rack, and they were coming in from an ISO 8 into an ISO 7 area and, and putting these bagged items in. And guess how they decontaminated them? So they took IPA in a spray bottle and sprayed down the outside. The correct way to do that would actually be to use a sporicide, either a wipe or a spray, and spray down each item in all directions. Why? To get the contact time and to get the coverage. Just spraying it down after you put it on a rack like this, you're getting very ineffective contact time. And for all you know, you could be bringing spores directly into the ISO 5. So I have a couple colleagues that actually worked on an article and they published it related to contact time, uh, Dave Shields and Waleed. And when you read it, uh, they talk a little bit about contact time here where they say uh, the validated wet contact time allows for demonstrated effective inactivation of microorganisms in the clean room, irrespective of clean room parameters 
or application techniques. Uh, that may affect the duration of time uh, the surfaces stays wet on uh, certain clean room surfaces. So disinfectant activity is actually halted or significantly uh, reduced when sufficient uh, liquid, insufficient liquid rather, is present. And it is not possible to adequately control the disinfection process without a minimum wet contact time. And I'll tell you, because I get asked this question a lot, once the product is dried on the surface and it's totally dry, if that surface is no longer wet, we are not killing, actively killing microorganisms. It's when the surface is wet. Now you can rehydrate some of that residue. And as my colleague Dan will tell you, you can rehydrate some of that disinfectant or disinfectant residue and you will see some efficacy but it's still not going to be to the levels of a wet disinfectant or a wet sporicide applied directly to the surface. So another key concept, and this is something uh, that my former colleague Joe McCall and I uh, published an article on, and we talked a lot about in the industry. And I can tell you, Dan and I were just at a facility a week ago where we saw very ineffective cleaning methods in the clean room. There they were taking uh, for example, a mop head that was wet with disinfectant solution going from an ISO 5 area to an ISO 8, an ISO 8 area to an ISO 5, and back and forth and back and forth. That's not how you clean the clean room. Another key thing would be they would go take a completely dripping mop head full of disinfectant, dripping a pool all the way across the room called what I, uh, Dan and I call the uh, rainforest effect, where I'm raining across the surface. Uh, to the bottom, what we call the cove, right above the floor, disinfecting the cove with the mop head, taking that same mop back to the bucket, goes into the rinse, goes into the disinfectant, and then I'm making another rainforest all the way across the room to the ISO 8 area. Very ineffective cleaning methods, and thus, that's a big issue. So what can happen from ineffective cleaning? Well, Look at the FDA observation here. Your firm failed to conduct adequate cleaning and disinfection of the APA, which is aseptic processing area. No additional cleaning and disinfection of the environmental sampling was conducted following shutdown of the ISO 5 hoods. So anytime you have finished your cleaning, especially in the hoods, you're gonna to wanna to do some EM sampling to verify how effective the cleaning really was. Another good one is here. It says the cleaning agents used to disinfect, clean, and sanitize equipment and or production areas in the clean room of non-sterile product are not suitable for use. I observed your firm used expired, and I get this a lot, so does Dan, sterile disinfectants to clean and sanitize. So even when you're taking a drug product and your past expiration date, is it gonna be as effective? Maybe not. So when you go beyond that expiration date, that's always a high area of risk. And I can't just write a letter to invalidate an expiry date. There's a reason that we have that data. So those are all things to uh, ponder about, think about. Another good one is here. It says, hard to reach areas uh, used to enclose the direct compounding area in the clean room uh, within the ISO 5 area are not cleaned. Why would you not clean areas in your ISO 5, right? For example, I observed a lack of cleaning by the sterile operator on the upper half portions of areas being used for sterile drug production. So if I've got a, whether it's a BSC hood or an ISO 5 curtained in area where I'm doing filling, why would I not clean the top part of the curtain or the top part of the uh, filling machine? Of course you would, right? You should be cleaning everything from the top of the operator height uh, down to the floor. Those are the critical zones in the room. And the highest area of risk is from your, the top of the operator to your waist level, the lower waist level. So here's an example. So we took a black light into the clean room. We want to look at bio burden and particles on the surface. So here we highlight all the particles on the clean room surface. They show up very vividly here. You can use something like Bug Scout to highlight what, you know, fluoresce what's 
uh, what's on that surface. So then Joe and I took a look at this and we showed different cleaning techniques. So one technique that some operators use at 3 a.m. in the morning is what I call the wax on, wax off technique here, where I'm like waxing my car outside to get it nice and shiny. Very ineffective technique, would not ever recommend it. What's the right way to do it? It is to take the wipe, make it fold in the forts, do the unidirectional overlapping strokes by roughly 20% or two inches. Why? Because it's like mowing your yard with lawnmower, John Deere. You wanna get complete coverage all the way across that surface. So overlap. And here you can see clearly the particles in the background. Why is that so critical? Let's say I'm using a mop on a wall. If you're using a microfiber or polyester mop, you wanna get it really adhered to the wall, not coming off the wall, and that overlapping unidirectional stroke. Now we have published in the IEST uh, journal an article where you can actually use a modified figure S, which looks like this, figure eight, I'm sorry, figure eight, modified figure eight on the wall and on the floor with a microfiber mop, but you have to do it correctly to completely cover all the surfaces. And you shouldn't be making any more than three laps on that surface before you go back to the bucket and get new mopping solution. And typically in the industry, just to clarify this, you ha should have used dilution of disinfectant in bucket chamber one and in bucket chamber two. That's been industry standard for about 10 years now. And that's whether you're doing a two or a three bucket cleaning routine. Uh, I really don't recommend one bucket systems. I've seen that a lot in Brazil. And the reason I don't like, a, like it, there's two key reasons. One, the solution gets very soiled and dirty. And two, it's not green and sustainable. So you go through millions of mop heads and a lot of solution. And it's just a ton of waste you have to get rid of. So I like the double bucket, triple bucket system. I even like the bucketless system by Valeda. All of those are good. Micronova, uh, Perfex, Valeda, those are all companies that make very good equipment out there in the industry. I'd encourage you to look at all of them. Here's that wiping technique and mopping technique. You notice the unidirectional overlapping strokes by roughly 20% or two inches to completely cover the surface. As I mentioned with these microfiber mops, you can do a modified figure eight routine on the wall or the floor, but the key is to com get complete wet coverage on those surfaces. And by the way, this applies to cell and gene therapy. A lot of cell and gene therapy areas are gowning room, which is ISO 8, and the clean room, which is ISO 7. And then, of course, you've got that BSC hood. So here's all the references Dan and I used in the webinar today. Uh, lots of USP uh, 43 references, uh, lots of FDA and uh, PDA references, and even WHO. So there's lots of references. Uh, we use that IEST document that references right here. Uh, and in there, by the way, if anyone is interested on bucket changeout frequencies for ISO 5, 6, 7, and 8 clean rooms, that uh, study and denotation is in this IEST document. We want to thank you today for attending our webinar. We hope that you gained some valuable, useful information from it. Uh, Dan, are, Dan and I are very pleased that, you know, we have over 120 folks that have been on the webinar this morning. Uh, and with that, Uday, we are happy to take any questions. And I'll move this over to get part of Dan and I in the uh, picture here. Uday, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I Thank just hope we didn't push you to sleep this morning. No, 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 no. It's very interesting. Uh, so let's let's look at the questions. Uh, First one is about first one is about hydrogen peroxide. Okay. Uh, is the hydrogen peroxide safe suitable for incubator and other such similar materials? Uh, it is, but you need to make sure if you're using it on any soft metals like copper, brass, aluminum, galvanized surfaces, that you have a rinse step afterwards with either 70% IPA, uh, because you want to make sure that there's very you know, very low potential for corrosion. So, uh, and Dan, did you want to? I, I, I couldn't quite hear the question. Was it hydrogen peroxide or paracetic acid and hydrogen peroxide? 
what is it like in Christ? Sorry. Here, but no, that's fine. Uh, yeah, that's so Dan was just asking for clarity on the question. So was it just hydrogen peroxide or hydrogen peroxide paracetic acid? Oh no, it's only hydrogen peroxide. Right. So with hydrogen peroxide, as, as you know, we pointed out, again, for efficacy point of view, you're going to need a little bit extended contact time. Um, but the good thing about you know hydrogen peroxide is is it is going to not leave a ton of residue. So it's going to be you know pretty good from that point of view. And uh, there's a, 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 a another sub question in this that which are the materials on which this cannot be used? Is it possible to just uh, off the hand say you know on these materials hydrogen peroxide cannot be used? Material compatibility for hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide. I said soft metal. Yeah, I agree with that. that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you hear us on that, Uday? We were saying. We don't recommend it on any soft metal, so copper, brass, aluminum, oh, okay. galvanized okay. metals, we wouldn't rec recommend it. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, in my experience on some of the areas, you know, with any spore side in your biosafety cabinet, you know, you got your stainless steel surface, work surface, your glass, you're pretty good there. And then maybe your outlet covers could be aluminum. Um, they're covering the power outlets if you have any in there. Um, and those certainly are something you got to watch for. And that's where it comes in where Jim's talking about the rinsing strategy and making sure you're not leaving things too long in those areas because you know you go into quite a few and you see a, a biosafety cabinet, you see just the corroded aluminum outlet cover, but the surface might look great. So some things you know to be aware of, it's the soft metals, aluminum, copper, brass, things like that. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, about discoloration of mop, uh, mop heads uh in one of your slides so then how do we decide when it is time to change a mop head so uh, i would always recommend so uday i would always recommend checking with the manufacturer of the mops uh, because they may have slightly different uh, uh data around them they'll generate data on this and normally what they can tell you is how many autoclave cycles or irradiation cycles that mop head can go through before it needs to be thrown out and certainly if the mop head that you're using looks really soiled and dirty, I would take it off and get a new mop head, right, Dan? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, this is another question about frequency of using sporocidal solution. Uh, can you just comment on that, how frequent it should be? Yeah, so I let me comment on it and then I want Dan to give his feedback is, I normally recommend to start off with once a month, maybe the last Friday of the month, uh, and why I do that is I'm pretty conservative. And what you should be looking at is an environmental monitoring and data trending that you have in the facility. So if you see more frequent hits of mold or bacterial spores, then I would increase the frequency to maybe bi-weekly or weekly. And if you see less frequency, you could even go out to quarterly. But quarterly is usually about the least I would see the spore site used in the clean room. And I would say once a week should be the most. Uh, now, when we're talking about BSC hoods or bringing items into a clean room or into a BSC hood, obviously sporicide use would be much more frequent there. I'd agree with that, absolutely. Um, yeah, sporicide is not something daily on the floor, so once a month seems to be the most standard. Uh, but again, that's, you, you, know, you have to trend your data and, and see what you're seeing. Um, if you're seeing a lot of bacillus species, well, you know you have bacterial endospores. If you're seeing a lot of uh, aspergillus hits or, or, or even, you know, any aspergillus hits to that degree, you have to then, you know, adjust accordingly. I agree with Jim on that one with our dough. If one, the uh, next question is here. If one uses water for injection uh, for rinsing the BSE, would the WFI itself contaminate the BSE? Because WFI is not sterile water or should we use sterile WFI? I would, and that's a good question. I think when you look at PDA's technical report number 70, uh, one of the suggestions it has for BSCs and ISO 5 areas is to use sterile WFI. And I guess I could see that because that would, of course, limit the risk at any bio burden there. Uh, but when we're talking about a hood, what I see used most frequently for residue removal and that kind of thing is IPA. So 70% IPA, 70% ethanol, that's probably going to be the first choice. 
Thank you. Okay, so here's a little long question. Let me try to read it out. Uh, say we are disinfecting materials to be loaded into BSC. After, sp after spraying and they are still wet, should we just let them stand outside the BSC and load them when they are dried? Or should we wipe them after sprayed, spraying until dried and then load into BSC as soon as possible to avoid outside environment? So usually the outside environment is ISO 7, so it's less controlled. The inside environment is ISO 5. So once you've totally wet the item with the sporicide, for example, I would probably put it in the hood or start to bring it into the hood, uh, and I would not rinse it unless you have a risk of residue from the sporicide or disinfectant. Uh, you know, affecting your production process. So let's say you're doing some manipulation of cells in the hood. Uh, you don't want to run a risk of adding a phenol or a quat into that. So with that being said, you might want to have a rinse step with IPA. But normally, I don't think if you're using just a sporocyte, it'd really be needed. Dan? Absolutely. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is again a question on hydrogen peroxide. Uh, while doing area fog fogging by H2O2, there are steps of stopping HVAC and doing fogging, followed by exhaust and then restarting of HVAC. Is stopping HVAC can cause, uh, will stopping HVAC cause increase in microbial count in the area since it increases the humidity? During, during fogging, where you actually are going through a disinfection process by fogging, I wouldn't imagine that you would give the microbes or the fungi adequate time to actually start to build up through that increased humidity. Um, so I, I don't believe that you would have any issue there if you're just stopping the HVAC for that type of fogging intervention that would have uh, a negative outcome in my experience yeah and dan you might know this better than me but when they're let's say for example doing bhp yeah. aren't they going to control humidity exactly i was thinking the same thing because you are going to adjust the humidity to artificial levels to get adequate efficacy of your bhp um so you're doing an intervention to to deal with microorganisms so i wouldn't worry about the adverse effects of the microorganisms growing in those conditions yeah, and I agree with that. Uh, I think that the risk would be very low because when you're bringing in VHP or that decon process and you're sealing off the HVAC and everything, uh, the whole objective there is to kill anything in the room, right? Yeah, yeah. So, right. Thank you. Uh, is the next question about a testing method for disinfectant efficacy? Can you give some references for that? Any? Um, absolutely. So basically, when you're trying to do any kind of disinfectant efficacy testing, uh, you're going to default to either an ASTM 2197 hard surface uh, coupon method, um, or you're going to look at a uh, European 13697 hard surface test method. And then you're going to apply to that typically USP 1072 criteria for pass fail, so a two log reduction for fungal and uh, bacterial spores and a three log reduction for vegetative bacteria. And we actually, I, I think we, we, we have some additional resources and webinars out there probably on the, on the YouTube channel about some of the best practices uh, around uh, performing and troubleshooting a DET test uh, because it, it basically, you know, it was gonna utilize a small uh, coupon of your test material that's gonna be inoculated. But those are the two best methods because they're quantitative. Some of the registration methods can be qualitative or can be more challenging. But if you look at the ASTM, uh, modified ASTM E2197 or an EN 13697, those are two really good methods to start looking at when you're trying to qualify disinfectants and efficacy against different bugs. Thank you. I think we can uh, we can consider this as a topic for one of our future webinars, uh, disinfectant efficacy testing. That's a good. <laughs> yeah, we'd be uh, we'd be glad to do that for you, Uday. We give uh, I think we give a very good presentation on that. And that's great. We'll we'll plan that. We'll discuss with Richard. Uh, now this is a very specific question about uh, the way you are cleaning the 
curtains. So regarding cleaning for curtains in ISO 57, is it acceptable to clean every at man level to down and once a week from the top to the ground? I would say uh, in ISO 5 areas, you should probably clean the entire level because ISO 5 is a very critical zone. But in, if the curtained area is in an ISO 7 or ISO 8, I think that that process you're talking about is fine because the most critical zone in terms of contamination is from the top of the operator's head down to the floor. So if you're going to just clean that level in the in the in what we call the non-sterile clean room areas, so ISO 7, ISO 8, that's fine. But I would say, um, you know, doing the whole thing once a week, the whole top to bottom of the curtain, uh, I think that's okay. But in ISO 5, typically everything gets cleaned in there very frequently. So I would say there, if, if the curtains are in an ISO 5 zone, I would probably still clean those daily. Thank you. So here's the next uh, question. Thank you for a wonderful session. These concepts of cleaning are equally valid for any clean room sterile manufacturing facility in addition to uh, stem and gene therapy. Uh, can you please comment on bacterial contamination versus fungal contamination? Well, let me say something then I'll turn it to Dan here is, so when you do your environmental monitoring and data trending in a clean room, uh, what we're typically doing is you're doing the RODAC plating, so your contact surfaces, you're doing uh, surfaces on the operator uh, for contact plating, you're doing active air sampling, uh, subtle plates, and swabbing. That gives you your, uh, essentially your picture and your videotape of what's going on in that clean room over time. So the most frequently uh, picked up organism in the clean room is always going to be vegetative organisms. So Staphylococcus, Micrococcus, very, very common because you have people in a room and we shed particles and skin flakes, millions of particles and skin flakes a day. And in fact, even after you're gowned up, you're still going to be shedding particles and skin flakes into the room. So vegetative bacteria are the most common. They're also the easiest to disinfect. Uh, I would say molds and bacillus are much less common but they are an issue because they're not as easy to disinfect. And uh, as Dan was saying when he was talking about the wall, uh, it, when you get these into interstitial surfaces like sheetrock, they can get onto other surfaces in the room like Tim Sandel says in his talk, and they can be spread by airflow patterns in the room to other areas of the clean room. So for example, then you're picking up mold on benches, you're picking up mold on trash cans, on all different surfaces in the room. So it spreads and procreates pretty quickly. And you can get the same phenomena with bacillus. So although they're not nearly as common in the clean room, they are a significant risk. And not only that, but many of them are pretty pathogenic. So we look at bacillus cereus or aspergillus or stachybotrys. Some of these uh, organisms are pretty pathogenic. Dan? That's exactly right, Jim. You said exactly what I was going to say. Uh, just in terms of frequency, and, and I think Tim Sandel published on this as well, that uh, a clean room evaluation over 10 years in the UK showed that maybe only 2 to 3% of the isolates are fungi, and the vast majority are going to be uh, bacteria because it comes from human skin. Um, so in terms of frequency, fungi aren't as big of a concern, but in terms of severity, as, as Jim just pointed out, it can really be something to be uh, cognizant and aware of. So, yeah, right. okay. Thanks. Okay, this is the next question about again validation of bytes. Uh, can EN16615 be used for validation of bytes for bacterial and fungicidal activity of disinfectants on surfaces of clean rooms? Uh, any any quantitative method can be used for validation. The 16615 method, you know, uses the the square granite block, which applies a uniform force to the surface, and also looks at translocation, which is which is a good method. Um, so it could be used for for that type of evaluation because it does give you a quantitative outcome where you can calculate log reduction. However, typically my advice would be um, to test the disinfectant. Uh, test the disinfectant itself and not necessarily test the wiping material 
or test the mopping material or testing the spraying application, but actually using one of those other methods like a 13697 and just applying the disinfectant directly onto there, um, even if the direct disinfectant's out of a, of a wipe solution, then you're evaluating the activity of the disinfectant yourself itself. You're not looking at the increased benefit of the mechanical action that could be coming from the wiping process or alternatively, you're not looking at a spray pattern that may be getting incomplete coverage. So I tend to recommend to take out the, the wipe element and just look at the disinfectant itself. But if you were interested, you could adapt that method probably uh, for some application. Jim, what do you think? Yeah, I completely concur. I guess the other thing is anytime you involve manual application, uh, even with wiping in the clean room, wiping surface, you can get variability because the way Dan wipes or mops the surface might not be the same as me. And it might not be as thorough or as complete either. Thank you. So let's take this as the last question. We are coming to the end of our time. Uh, uh, can you comment on setting limits for fungus in ISO 7, ISO 8, and generally all these areas? Any guidelines? Yeah. I mean, Sure, I can do that. So I would say when you start to look at setting limits, uh, they should be reality-based, so looking at your environmental monitoring data and trending data. And you can either set limits uh, in addition to the whole room, specifically for molds, or you can have that as being a component of mold. And so one of the things I see a lot in industry uh, with molds, as an example, I would see maybe in an ISO 7, ISO 8 environment, maybe a limit of no more than 10, you know, mold hits. But I'll preface that with, since there's a, such a big concern in the industry now, you need to kind of determine, well, what type of mold are you seeing? If it's something that's really pathogenic and spreads very quickly, we want to get a handle on this. So you may want to have a tighter limit of maybe five for ISO 7 and 8. Now, anytime we talk about the ISO, uh, for, I'm sorry, for ISO 5, the aseptic area, the limit really for anything should be one or less than one. So ISO 7 and 8 or 9, you could be looking at 5 or 10 for mold. Uh, but again, you want to look at specifically what type of mold are you seeing. So send it out to Charles River, get it, get the genus and species of it. Is it pathogenic? Is it not? Uh, where are you seeing it? If you're seeing it close to your filling zone and filling area, or you're picking it up in your BSC hood, that's a lot higher risk and you're going to want to investigate that, find the source and prevent it and control it. Dan? Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. With this, we'll come to the end of our question and answer session. And before we end our webinar, I will hand it over to you for your final comments to both of you. Hey, Udi, I just want to say it's a pleasure. Uh, Dan and I love presenting for you and for your group. We always get uh, very high and great attendance. Uh, we would be happy to set a date with you to give a webinar on validating and qualification of disinfectants. Dan? Yeah, really appreciate the opportunity. Appreciate the thoughtful and excellent questions. Um, always very impressed with uh, when working with you. So thank you so very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jan. Uh, for this excellent presentation and answering all the questions. Thank you, delegates, joining today for this session. Uh, with this, we'll be closing this webinar. Stay safe, follow the government regulations, and we'll meet on 30th August for an interesting webinar on ICHQ12. Please do join in. Thank you. Bye-bye and good night. Mm -hmm. Take care. Thanks.